Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Film Audit, a podcast by four college students with a passion for movies. My name's David. I'm Spencer. I'm TK. I'm Jared. And today we have a special guest with us. Uh, Aaron, do you want to introduce yourself? And I'm Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Aaron. I'm David's brother, fellow film critic and lover. Or not of David, but I, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we're lucky to have Aaron with us. Um, he's a good friend of uh, all of ours. We like to get together and do uh, RPGs sometimes. And Aaron and I have a long history of watching movies together. Uh, we we uh, really like watching bad movies. That was something we started several years ago with uh, Battleship. And uh, we've gone through like the James Bond movies and the Star Trek movies. So... I've had a lot of fun being able to watch a lot of stuff with him and talk to him about stuff. And uh, so it's, it's fun to have him here with, with, with you all right now, too. A good sign that, that uh, we're a good fit is that while watching Battleship, we spent a lot of time just laughing at the absurdity of it all. So that, that pretty much puts us in the same camp as far as movies go. And then we've watched a lot of really good movies. And usually we, we agree on the, the big points, although we sometimes differ in some of the more uh, the, the smaller points. So I'm excited to do this. This is awesome. I love it. So recently we got a long-awaited sequel to what is considered by some to be a classic. Um, and so we all went back and watched the original Top Gun and then went to the theaters and watched the new one. Um, TK Spencer and I actually were able to do a double feature where in the afternoon we were able to watch the original and then just right afterwards head over to um, the theater and watch the new one. So that was pretty fun. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> That's apparently all we have to say about Top Gun. <laughs> it's uh, fun. It's got a lot of charm to it. It's, uh, it's a bit dated, but it's it's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, very, very 80s. Yeah. Um, <laughs> really just embodies it, which is it's cool on its own, you know, like... It's fun for that reason at times. It's like good 80s, like all the good things about the oh, 80s. Oh, yeah. Like the synths that you get within the soundtrack, it mm. definitely has that yeah. vibe, and I loved it. Take my breath away. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I, got, I got so sick of that song. <laughs> Take my breath away plays like at least 12 times in that whole t movie. See, for me, I love that because one of my favorite scenes from Ocean's Eleven is where they're flashing back to all the attempted robberies. And the last one, when the guy gets shot, it plays that song uh, as he's getting shot. He throws all the money into the air in this like comically over the top slow mo shot. And so every time that was playing on in Top Gun, that's all I could think of. And so that made it much more memorable. And oh my! I could endure those <laughs> those endless take my breath away scenes because I just thought of a guy throwing up all of his money into the air as he died and you know, <laughs> getting shot from yeah as he died. It was great. But I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to. You know, here I am, the guest. I'm gonna. I'm gonna interject here a little bit. I'm gonna have to dissent a little bit in that I did not like uh, the first Top Gun movie. I thought it was um, a pretty self-indulgent uh, Gary Stu level movie, and I felt like it uh, like did not live up to even like the middle level expectations that I that I set for mm -hmm. it. Where I, by the time it was done, I really liked um, Iceman. I really, uh, I really liked Val Kilmer because I thought he was a level-headed, real leader, and I thought Maverick was, frankly, pretty annoying mm. <laughs> throughout the whole movie. So I, I saw all of like it was definitely dripping in '80s stuff, and there were several points where like I didn't think that uh, Tom Cruise or Maverick was like a bad person, but he never learned like anything out of that movie except that you're awesome and you should just be allowed to keep being <laughs> awesome. Which is one of the reasons why I liked, and we'll talk about this in a minute, one of the reasons why I liked the sequel so much better is because it actually acknowledged that he was going through, despite being so awesome, was going through the turmoil of having failed Goose. Yeah. And that was actually like the main conflict that he had to resolve in that movie, which was great because they do not address it in the original movie. Spoilers. <laughs> but like after, yeah, for a movie that came out 40 years ago. Uh, when Goose when 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 Goose dies and Maverick goes to his wife, his wife's entire spiel to Maverick is Maverick, don't feel bad. Maverick, Goose would have loved you. Ma 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 Goose would have gone with you. And it's like, wouldn't the wife be more like ticked off that her husband is now dead and now she has to raise a kid on her own? She, but she wasn't. She was just so concerned for Maverick, and everybody was just so concerned for poor old Maverick in that movie, where. 
yeah, I just I didn't get it. I like and I didn't I thought the action scenes were shot pretty poorly uh, because the the editing didn't always stitch things together right. There were several times where I had to back it up because I watched it you know didn't watch in the theaters I could watch from home where I had to back it up and say wait what were the sequence of events there because it looked it would look like the airplane was going one way and then it was all by itself and then suddenly it was with something else and like the only thing that really stitched those scenes together was like the the radio talk over it the radio chatter. That made me okay. That's what's supposed to be happening, and I'll just kind of forgive that the editing doesn't quite get there. Which I get. It's a, it was a lower. I think it was a lower budget movie. I don't think it was like, and it was a lot harder in the eighties to film it than it would be now. I can think of a scene in particular in the first one where it's um he uh is given the other ja- uh, birdie like from above. That whole sequence, like I couldn't understand what was going on and then the radio chatter like kind of filled it in for me and i had to back it up but i didn't understand it's like the part where how oh, i forget someone's being followed and then uh, maverick pulls up and comes up upside down above him and he says you see the birdie and uh i like if you go back and watch that none of it makes sense like it does for a little bit but then you're like wait mm-hmm. which play am i looking at what jazz is this yeah oh okay now i think yeah. this one's being followed it's like guy lock i'm like oh okay I guess we do. And then you see him above him. I'm like, okay, I, these are, I know which one it is now, but <laughs> just. <laughs> That's something that I noticed about all the fight scenes was that I could never tell exactly who we were watching at any given moment. Mm-hmm. Like I had no idea whose plane was whose. Cause they all looked the same. And even inside the cockpits, a lot of the times the camera would be like so close or like moving too much that I couldn't make out like what their helmet said. So it was just a lot of like, cutting between people in a, in a ship and people outside and like, you know, seeing the ship moving around and I, I didn't know who was who. And that's something that the remake does a lot better is like, I'm always able to tell in the remake who I'm watching and who I'm following. But in the original, it was just anyone's guess as to what was going on. Yeah. I was going to say, it felt like someone was deliberately voicing over a bunch of unrelated shots and trying to create a narrative over that. It kind of reminds me of, um, the whose line is it anyway skit where Colin would do the green screen and he would have to create a narrative to like assemble all of these random clips and all these hints that people were giving him and to making like a true news story that was going on, even though he had no idea what was happening. So it kind of felt like that where like, here we have all these unrelated shots of planes and somehow I have to explain why we went from how we got from a to B with any of the stories. Like there's the shot, especially when goose ej- is, tries to eject out of the, out of the, out of the jet. And he gets hit by the canopy. And so you see the shot where the canopy he hits the canopy and he falls back down with the canopy into the jet. And the next shot are two people in the parachutes you know, floating down to the ocean. And on top of that, Goose is the first one to land. And so the whole time I was like, wait, who is where and where is who and who got hit with the canopy? Because it looked like Goose got hit with the canopy and then two unrelated people are falling out of the sky. And then Goose is now in the water. It was like very kind of like rushed. Yeah, rushed, and you had to, like, really catch it and really be focusing on what was happening, which is, like, a little bit too much effort, I guess, that they were expecting of us. Especially since this is, like, the second or third fighter jet scene, and up till now, like, hardly any of the, those scenes really contribute to the plot. So you're kind of able to just turn your... You're expecting to just be able to turn your brain off because you've not been required like nothing really important ever happens in the sky yeah usually there's just like training exercises so when that suddenly happens you're like oh whoa like yeah there's supposed to be a competition going on with like who can get the most points based on the training exercises and so they have like awkward voiceover it's like oh as they start the the uh the training exercise oh iceman has this many points and maverick has this many points and they don't really spend a lot of time like going into like if uh, in in Harry Potter, not not even in the movies, but in the books, there'd be periodic there, periodically they would like go back to the house cup and and like show the different points that were there, and then they would talk about it. So, so like there, if they if we had had more scenes where they were talking about the competition and they were getting in each other's faces, or they were being um you know they were they were having like little cockfighting contests or pissing contests on who could uh do well on the next competition or the next uh, training exercise. If if it had, if it had like shown them talking about the points more, yeah, or that that was like the like the 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 the, the main conflict. But anytime they were on the ground, it was just Tom Cruise visiting his girlfriend. Mm. Yeah, that was that was another thing that I noticed is I I turned to I think Jenny I turned to her and I was like, what's the conflict of the movie? Like for the first half, 
you're just watching Maverick trying to seduce the army lady and then he finally does and then the second half nothing really happens until Goose dies and then he like loses his mojo and then he has to get it back in time for finally like some conflict where like the bad guys show up and they have to take him out otherwise since the points thing doesn't really seem to be like a concrete or like substantial conflict we're just kind of watching these characters just like live their lives on this army on this like marine base yeah and going to school and like talking and i think that's pretty much what the whole plot was it was just a bit it wasn't very uh tethered together very nicely it was just right. kind of like loose yeah but it makes it so like at least for me like goose's death like came out of nowhere because they're just like at this school and then suddenly a character just dies mm-hmm. i will say it did not come out of nowhere because i knew within the first 10 seconds of goose speaking that he was a goner <laughs> like in that very first scene when they're talking and, and like maverick talks to goose and goose responds like i have it in my notes it's like oh goose is a goner and I, I, you know, I didn't even know really much, much of the plot of the movie, but I just heard him say one line. I'm like, yep, he is dead. He is dead meat. And I was just waiting for it to happen. Plus, then I started to see like, oh, he's the one person who's got a normal life at home. He's got a, he's got a wife and kid. Oh, he's, he knows how to play the piano, guys. He's, you know, he has a great song that he loves to sing. And his kid's there. <laughs> this guy's going places. <laughs> I just think, yeah, I think a good like word for the movie is like unfocused. There's a lot that kind of goes on, but you never really see the clear purpose of it. And uh, it doesn't really come together. I will say that the film redeemed itself a little bit more for me at the end, because I did get a little bit more excited during that final action scene, even though it was still kind of hard to make out what was going on. There were at least like clear stakes involved. Um, and it was like, you know, everyone's life was on the line as opposed to all of the training exercises where it was kind of ambiguous as to like what the risks of someone losing a training exercise were. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I think the, the real story that's, that lies within Top Gun is that a hotshot pilot loses his wingman and has to like reevaluate what he's in the service for. So he starts off as the hotshot who can do no wrong, um, which was introduced weirdly because it's not like he's he's reprimanded, but then immediately promoted at the very beginning of the movie. So that was all off right off the bat a weird disconnect, and it feels like those two ideas were in constant competition. Where do we have him be the character who's like perfect and does everything right in the fighter jet and is just the bestest, or do we have a flawed character who has to grow into the role of being? the best pilot where uh you know they're having this competition and the the end of the movie could even be somewhat of a statement on the competition where at the end of the movie you have all these top gun candidates who are going into this fighter fighter fight this this dog fight and the and at the end the points didn't matter because what mattered was who could think who could be in the moment and survive so like they do lose a couple of pilots in that final dogfight, but they're never really like focused on like, I guess Hollywood died. Oh, that's just an, an over. That's just a voiceover line. And it's just a throwaway. And so it wasn't until the end credits when they were showing us who Hollywood was. I'm like, Oh, that's who that was. So if at the end it had been here, we had all of this, you know, this, this petty rivalry between the characters because of points. But at the end of the movie, it doesn't matter because they just have to survive. That would have been a cool uh, premise for a movie. And I think, I think the, the second, the, the sequel does a better job at that too, where, uh, it doesn't matter what the points were, who had the, you know, who was doing the best. What mattered was sticking with your wingman and sticking with your partners. Like, okay, that's a cool message. That's a good message to have in the movie, but it got lost in the weeds of we got to make Tom Cruise awesome and he makes no mistakes. Yeah. So I don't know a lot of the production history behind the movie if that was a thing because I I suspect that's a thing now if it wasn't then where Tom Cruise has to be the best because I don't think I've seen a movie where he's not the best. But the movies that know how to use Tom Cruise well are the ones that say, okay, fine, you can be the best, but you but you have some sort of demon to conquer that puts you and keeps you as a flawed character. You're either uh, trying to right or wrong, or you're atoning for something, or you're the underdog, which is the one they go for the most with Tom Cruise. But at least like put him in a situation where he's not just the best, he has to work his way up to it. Yeah. And that 
that brings me to my point uh to another point you brought earlier just um his character i feel like wrestles with that idea a little bit more in the second one which is why like seeing both of these movies um so close together it made me realize like how much better they they tackled this problem he should have had more in the first one that he can't just be perfect so that's why like the opener to the second movie i felt was was great a great way to introduce that like like first we have these cool shots of like oh look how awesome tom cruise is like look at his hangar life with his nice plane and he's gonna get on his motorcycle and like bike in the desert and you see him doing like this cool um like secret operation with this new jet but then we we get to see his flaw where he he's there to help everyone and and to save this project but it's not enough for him as a pilot he wanted to go just a little bit more and just just keep pushing limits to the point to where he's not listening to anyone anyone so we learn right off the bat this guy hasn't changed that much and that this is something that he still has to battle and having that premise made him so much more interesting as a character being a half you know top gun pilot slash teacher to these other top gun pilots um i i felt i'd like that a lot more for the second movie yeah i'm 100 percent with you on that i i like how like with the opening scene you're describing it shows the consequences of like this over ambition that he has like unlike the first one where he does something bad and then it's kind of slapped on the wrist but then promoted in this one he you know you're like oh yeah he did it he he showed the the commander guy or whatever that he's capable that this ship is capable of Mach 10 or whatever. But then you see the consequence of him pushing himself and the jet and you see that he literally crashes and burns and, um, you know, they, they send him somewhere else to as kind of as punishment, but also they need him. But I, I think that that sets him up as more of a flawed character. And then like Aaron said about the first one, how it doesn't really make him grapple with goose's death very much. This whole movie grapples with that idea in that Maverick is trying to deal with the fact that he feels responsible for Goose's death while he's also trying to repair the relationship that he has with Goose's son. And so there's a lot more of an emotional core and Tom Cruise himself has things that he needs to overcome in his own life in order to succeed in order to bring the team to succeed too. Yeah. Like this is a, this is a direct contrast to Kenobi where like we said, Kenobi basically resets the character from episode three in order to have him end in the exact same place that episode three ends. This movie feels like a response to the first movie instead of just being a soft reboot or a reset of the character where he still has moved on from those days, but there are still things about him that he has to work out and they're externalized by him having to um, work around Miles Teller, Miles Teller's character of trying to reconcile his past. And I liked that they made it more complex than just, um, I was, you know, I, I rejected his, his uh, entrance to the Navy. I rejected his Navy application on the basis of, um, on the basis of, I thought, didn't think he was ready. It was like, Oh no, his mom didn't want him to. And so I decided to take that upon myself. Like that was pretty powerful because yeah. again, it means Tom Cruise did nothing, you know, didn't do, he did the right thing still, but it also means that like he voluntarily accepted this burden of having to be the scapegoat for Miles Teller and the, and the, and for the rest of the movie, Miles Teller never figures out that what the real story was. He, Tom Cruise allows himself to be the, the, the bad guy in that situation. I thought that was a fantastic way to turn a mentor character into also somewhat of a, of a, you know, of an antagonist to Miles Teller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he doesn't ever really tell Miles Teller, does he? Like it's always kind of secret the entire film. He doesn't even tell him at the last act of the movie that suddenly felt like a mission impossible film. (laughs) Yeah. He never, he never reveals that, uh, that what the real story was. He just repairs his relationship with Miles Teller so that they both have to reconcile with that fact. I think I think if we're talking about like character relations, um, another contrasting point for me is that uh, in the first movie, I didn't really care about Maverick's relationship with Charlie because um, I feel like it's just very shallow and not interesting and doesn't really amount to too much. Um, but I think that his relationship in the new movie with the 
uh, what's the actress's name? Uh, Jennifer Connelly. Jennifer Connelly. Her name's Penny. Yeah, his relationship with her, I feel, is somehow weaker. Like, I didn't care about the relationship in the first one, but I care even less about his relationship in the second one. And I feel like if you were to get rid of her scenes, the movie would pretty much stay exactly the same. Yeah, like... One mm-hmm. one scene that I thought was pretty powerful was like when they first meet up again, and she's like, "Oh, uh, you got to pay for everyone's drink," you know. And then the, when Miles Teller's character Rooster starts playing "Great Balls of Fire" on the piano, and like he's getting like that that flashback where he, like Jennifer Connelly looks into his eyes, uh, and she sees like the pain that he's like just remembering, like, "Oh my gosh, like I used to his father used to be my wingman." Uh, if we got rid of Jennifer Connelly's just scene of her like observing that i think it still would have been just as impactful yeah you know even more so because there'd be probably... more focus on exactly yeah that was probably like my 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 biggest thing uh my biggest like irk with the movie just just all of their scenes together felt like segues for them to open up ideas for the movie and and his character like she wasn't there other than other than to serve a voice that voiced questions that the movie wanted us to ask it was just like it never felt like a a relationship i wanted to watch it was just like oh and we'll learn this about tom cruise or or maverick and like through the vessel of this woman it's just and it had me questioning like is this no she wasn't in the first one it just like i had to like play my mind like why do we care so much about this girl and like okay no we're just gonna pretend that you know she's very important and she's gonna tell us all the things maverick needs to do which is it's fine. <laughs> She's so pointless as a character that she even just has the, the 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 sage daughter who has all the wisdom. Like there are several points where the daughter would just say, "And make sure you don't break her heart again." It's like, yeah, you're 13. Like I don't like I can't really imagine a 13 year old deciding that. That's the thing you're going to tell the guy. Yeah, that's that's the thing that you're going to tell the man who just fell out of your roof and you just happen to see him in the kitchen, that's how the 13-year-old girl responds. Like, yeah, like, yeah, right. okay. yeah. You're, you're just there in order to, to deliver the exposition. I think if Jennifer Connelly's character, or Penny, was in the original 80s film, then we, like what Jared was saying, we could, pro- we could get a, a better sense or feeling or connection with the character. I think what the director was trying to do in the new Top Gun, or Maverick, in this film was, you know, for us to kind of just imagine how Maverick lived his life when he was younger and lived over there by Top Gun and how he was kind of just ruthless or just didn't really care too much, you know, because he, I don't know, just drove, uh, or drove, flew planes recklessly and just moved around and got stationed everywhere else where he was assigned to. But when he comes back and understands the assignment, it shows that he's matured a whole lot more. And we see that not only through, like, as a pilot, but also as a person in a re- like that can be in a relationship. And Penny's just seeing him more as like this immature kind of guy, and still sees him that way. But slowly, as she realizes his mission to come back and his uh, see how he's changed and matured, then she's like, okay, you know, maybe I can see myself getting into a, a serious relationship with him this time. You know, it might go somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I could really see what they were trying to go with there. I think that's a really interesting idea to show him also in his personal life, how he can't like this, uh, this mode, not motivation, but like this persona of a person that he's maverick and top gun. Like it, it affects his personal life too. I, I like that. It just, for me at times felt like, like when we first saw her, I was like, Oh, that's the kind of the same idea I got to him. Like, this is an interesting way to view him, but then it just kept going. Like we got more scenes. So I was like, why you know like i get it but then it just at some point evolved into okay the writers need someone that we can hear like maverick's inner thoughts and problems that he can say to someone it just felt like that's the only at a certain point i don't know when but it felt like that's all she was there for you know yeah i don't i think the idea of writing a character just for the sole purpose of having your protagonist have someone to uh, exposit information to is kind of a weak excuse for a character but yeah, I, I think you're right. I think she mostly just serves as like a sounding board for Maverick to tell the audience stuff about himself and for her to tell the audience stuff about him. Yeah. If she had an arc, if she had something that she had to learn in the movie or something that she had to overcome, I think a lot of that goodwill would have been there. Um, but her 
her her arc becomes mostly just intertwined with Maverick in the end. Even though I really liked the scene where he has to break the news of his assignment to her, I really liked that sequence because it was told without a single line of dialogue. Just him leaning in with it. he's in full regalia. He leans in, he whispers something to her, and you see her her expression change, and you even see like Tom Cruise is like biting his cheek or he's like tensing his cheek. And he's doing that to like avoid having an, like a full blown emotional response. I thought that was really powerful. Um, but again, she has no arc except for just to be emotionally supportive, which means, you know, regardless of how well Jennifer Connelly did as an actress, there was nothing for her to do in the movie except just sit there and be supportive to to Maverick. Hmm. I agree. At least I got someone that's Tom Cruise's height this time, and roughly the same age. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They also avoided the problem that like stuff like Indiana Jones four has where you get Marion back because she was in the first movie and we're going to rekindle that, that flame. They didn't bring Charlie back into Top Gun Maverick. So that, because again, that would, that would be an issue of resetting the narrative where the t- original Top Gun movie ends with them in a relationship. And if the next movie is like, Oh, we broke up. It's like uh, national treasure two that opens with, Oh, by the way, they split up off camera. It's like, wait, I, like the, like we were invested, or at least, you know, we should have been, we were supposed to be in, invested in this relationship and it just broke, you know, it had to, it has to be rekindled and we as an audience don't feel that weight. So at least they introduced a new person. Although I did think that was funny. Then it's like, okay, so now we have the symptom of this main character can just pick a new girl, every movie and they'll automatically fall head over heels. Cause it's Tom Cruise, all five foot four of them. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of speaking of Tom Cruise, what did you guys think of the action in this movie? I liked it. Uh, um, that that for me that was like the strongest point. My favorite part of the movie was like just I, I like that the movie starts with hearing for people that didn't know like how much of this was real effects and like them really flying these planes and them going through like they tried to make it uh, as little VFX as possible. So going into the movie with that knowledge for everyone to know that just may like, like right off the bat, you're watching, you're like, wow, what the heck? Like, this is all real. And, uh, and for me, like bringing it back to a point we made, that was a fault in the first movie where the editing's kind of weird. I feel like they did a lot better job editing this one to make it to where like, a, you know, what's going on, but B like, they keep it intense instead of just like, I'm just watching a, like, like for example, um, Nothing in the first movie, especially their training stuff, felt very high stakes, and we just hear a lot of talking about points. But in this one, we get a chance to see, like, okay, here's their simulated route. This is what they have to do. And you see them sitting in the classroom watching the simulation while the editing is showing us them doing it. And even though they're, like, they could very easily show us a camera of them, like, over the planes flying. uh, Planes not going. Over the ground flying. And you're like, okay, this isn't very high stakes. This isn't like cutting through a canyon, but it keeps showing us the, the track and you're like getting tense about it and just like very, very, uh, I just loved it. I loved it so much. Yeah. I was really impressed by the fact that like all of the interior shots of all the characters flying were all legit. And one of the things that I was kind of just briefly skimming over when I was looking at the details of the movie on like Wikipedia or something was that they had to train all of the actors First of all, not only like how to be flying these jets, but how to operate the camera because the camera is inside the jet. And so they needed to teach the actors how to operate the camera. So that way they were in focus and it looks nice. So that way they could get the shots that they needed to, to edit into the action sequences later. I just think that that's like insane. Cause like at this point, I'm kind of used to seeing Tom wow. Cruise risk his life for movies and just do the most insane stunts that you've ever seen in your life. But then watching all of these other like young actors rising to that same standard was just like exhilarating. Right. Yeah. And like, I remember hearing, seeing an interview where I think it was Phoenix, uh, one of the lady pilots. She was like, uh, yeah, we didn't have makeup artists in the planes with us. It was just us by ourselves. So we had to do that. I had to organize the camera, like what David was saying and just film it. And I was like, I had no idea. Yeah. Like, cause I was thinking, cause yeah. I, I know what Jared has said earlier, like, they wanted all this to be as real as mu- as possible with less VFX, you know, stuff like that. So just hearing that and them expressing their their emotions and feelings while they were filming, it it was a it, it's just awesome to hear. So there's that shot at the end of the movie where uh, Tom Cruise has to launch the F-14 off of a very short runway, 
And so he guns it really, really hard. And you see Miles Teller like hit his head against the canopy. Apparently that was not a scripted moment. That was a moment that was uh, like what? organic where Miles Teller was legitimately caught off guard. And uh, it was, a, it was a take they decided to run with instead because it looked so much better. And it, it fit the narrative of the movie that, you know, Miles Teller was always kind of already kind of nervous. So they worked it into the movie to make that feel really uh, compelling. And it did, you know, I pardon the phrase, but it made you feel like you were in the cockpit where it made you feel like you were actually flying alongside these people and you were ducking and weaving and turning and you were facing the G's with them. Yeah. Just by the nature of like how the cinematography was handled, how the directing was handled, how like the POV shots were handled, whether it was looking at the pilot or seeing what they were seeing. Um, they did a good job of integrating the, um, the HUD and the dashboard for each jet so that you felt like you could see what was going on. And if there was like overhead display, it was very clear what all what it meant at all times. So there was, you know, so you could just focus on the intensity and, and the, uh, the impact of the action where like, it really did feel like these were high stakes because they were actually every mission, every exercise was preparing them for the main mission. And then there were twists in what the expectations were. And then they were changing how things like the, the parameters of the mission, so the only the only thing that was weird about that is the scene where Maverick decides to prove that they can do it in under two minutes thirty seconds. They're all surprised that he got up in the air, and it's like, yeah, you know, they would probably have known that he was in the air the moment he like stepped out under the tarmac because there would have been someone calling, was like, hey, there's a there's a there's a fighter jet on the runway. Did we authorize that? It said nah, and, and for dramatic dramatic timing, they're not, they don't discover that until it's conveniently available on the holographic display that they've got end up there which i thought was pretty laughable yeah and he's able to like tap his mic into their feed and they're able to listen to him talk somehow i guess and 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 consistently too because sometimes they talk and it's talking through the microphones and other times they're talking and it's not and it's not really so it's it's definitely like dramatically convenient uh radio chatter but it was all very visually told so that you weren't wondering what was what things were supposed to mean and uh, the fact that we have enough technology to kind of simulate the trench run that they do made it feel um, like, okay, it's not like they're risking their lives in these training exercises just yet or at quite as severely as they would be in the real deal. Um, but we have a holographic display that can kind of determine whether or not they're doing. So they, they incorporated the technology really, really well Yeah. Uh, into like how they made their film visual. Yeah. Using both of those. Yeah. Was w- made it more interesting as you're watching. And it never like feels excessive either. Like it doesn't seem like they just put in a bunch of like shots of like the planes flying or things like it wasn't, it didn't really ever turn into like military porn in the same way that a lot of the first one kind of feels like. Yes. Except uh, for the football yeah. scene, of course. Oh yeah. I mean, you got to have a, a volleyball scene equivalent just with fewer like, but it was lubed up bodies. But can we talk about the volleyball scene they have in this movie? Because it actually served a purpose. Like the, the John Hamm comes out and says, why are they doing this? Because that's what you ask in the first movie. Why are they just having a random volleyball tournament? Why are they having a random football fight? And then Tom Cruise explains, oh, here's the reasoning why. They're playing offense and defense at the same time. Here's the tactic. And like, especially for me as a teacher, I was like, thank you. You've you've expressed an explicit objective for this lesson. And now we see like it's, it's doing so much more than just being a, aren't we cool because we're shirtless scene. Right. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's able to say like, you, you wanted me to make a team and I'm making you a team right here. And then he's able to look out and visually see the way that everyone's getting along, especially contrasting with the way that they were all kind of butting heads at the beginning, especially with that one hot headed guy. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, you guys have anything else to say about Top Gun Maverick before we start giving scores? The last thing I wanted to say is that I thought that the, while the first act was a little bit kind of a little bit, awkward it was much tighter than the first movie and it the whole the entirety of the second act was you know with jennifer Connolly and her performance with with well with her story anyway was a little bit underwhelming but um i did like it and i had pretty much no problems with the movie at all in terms of like the movie for what it wanted to be until the very end um number one that we had all of these characters built up and i thought for sure someone was going to have to die uh, at this, at the end, at the at the last mission, and so I wasn't sure who it was, and I was very, it was very intense the entire time, and at the, and then when it's all over, they all survived, and I was thinking, oh well, then why did we introduce the extra F, a fifth generation fighters? Why did we have the Sams? You know what's what's going on? And then uh, Tom Cruise gets hit, and I was like, oh, that's an interesting twist, and I thought that actually makes sense 
as a character like arc that just as Tom Cruise has finally wrapped up all of his uh, his conflicts and he's you know, there's even that ominous line we'll talk about it when we get back and like oh now Tom Cruise gave the ultimate sacrifice Miles Teller survived and he proved himself to be like the ultimate father figure I thought that's a a very powerful moment to end on. Um, they could even have it where he's buried next to Iceman and, you know, that's like these were the wingmen or something like that. And then it fades back and Tom Cruise isn't dead. And we get a really like, I really hate it when movies, because they do this a lot now. And I think the Marvel movies have kind of cemented this where you have all these in the nick of time shots where you see the helicopter, which of course has to turn like a comical monster in real life. Like that, the, the helicopter wouldn't have turned to see, uh, Maverick, it would have been the pilot. <laughs> and so it then chases him down. And then just as it's about to hit him, he gets hit with a missile. Like, oh, we don't hear Miles Teller's, we don't hear the missile at all. We don't hear Miles Teller's jet. It's just suddenly there's a missile and it blows it up. And then suddenly uh, in the nick of time, Miles Teller's uh, plane gets hit. And then just before they get shot by the fifth generation fight or something, like there were a lot of contrivances at the very end where I thought like, this is a fourth act to a movie. And like I said, it felt very much like a Mission Impossible movie where suddenly like we're on foot and we have to do a lot of running and we have like a, a, like a special target we're trying to reach and they have to do a very mission impossible level stunt, which is get a plane off a very short runway. Like I thought it was going to be um, Simon Pegg in the back of the plane rather than miles Teller at that point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I agree with some of the sentiments, uh, Aaron, about the ending. Um, I also thought that that would have been a fitting end to the character, but on the other hand, I did, I did quite enjoy the Mission Impossible uh, scenario. I just, I don't know. It's yeah. fun. I mean, and like, it's, it's Mission Impossible. It's fun. Well, and like, this is a Top Gun movie. And so, you know, a, a certain amount I can just kind of forgive. Given. Yeah, because yeah, it's just it's just trying to be uh, a thrill a minute, fun, good old American uh, movie. And it, it does that. And I, I think I think it does it well. But um, so I guess. First, let's go around and give our ratings for uh, the first Top Gun. I can start. Um, so I think that's the first Top Gun, um, I did have it rated at a 6 out of 10. But um, I think that was really just because I was coming off of the high of the ending. I think overall, though, I will have to drop it to a 5 out of 10. Um, I did like it a little bit, but I do think that it has a lot of flaws, too. I think I'm kind of in the same boat. I think I would say 5 out of 10 as well. It's just not as good as I was expecting. It's like my dad's favorite movie ever. And to have that kind of praise, I was expecting a lot better. So five out of 10 for me. Uh, I think I ranked it a little higher. Um, I don't know, I guess as a kid, I always wanted to be a pilot. I always played like Ace Combat. Uh, and I don't know, it, being a fighter pilot was like kind of a bit of a dream of mine. So seeing that, and you know dad in the military kind of meant a lot because i could understand uh kind of you know people who go out and serve what they kind of go through so i gave it like a seven out of ten uh but then again i didn't think it was the best movie i can understand where people were coming from like eh, it's okay but i can see also see why it's, they would also consider it a classic so uh, yeah seven out of ten for me uh yeah for the first one for me um i would give a a five out of ten. Uh, there was definitely moments I liked. Um, so at, at times the eighties uh, being drowned in the eighties vibe was cool, uh, and it definitely was cool to see um, how they were able to pull off some of the the visual stuff with the jets back in the eighties. But um, with the flawed character of Maverick at times, and especially in comparison to uh, to the to the new one, this is a little bit uh, weaker than than a, a six for me. So I, I gave it a, a solid five. Mixed feelings, loved it at times. Didn't like it as much some a lot of the times, but yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm going to echo, I, I give it a 5 out of 10, probably closer to 4 than a 6, but it was one of those movies where I got the point and I could see, like, I could see where, like, if this were a lower budget movie that was really trying to, to get itself off the ground, like, I think I would be much more forgiving of it, but as it stands, uh, it was just too unfocused and too self-indulgent for me to really, really care. And like I said, by the end of the movie, I loved Iceman and I really didn't care for Tom Cruise. So um, for me, it's a, it's a five out of 10. Nice. 
Um, for the sequel, I thought that it pretty much improved on the original in every single way, except for that romance. Um, and I think that's the, the, the biggest thing that held it back for me. Otherwise, I thought that it was just a really fun time. Uh, so I'd give Top Gun Maverick a 7 out of 10. I enjoyed it a lot more than the first one, like David. And I think it really plays into its strengths that came from the first movie, which was like a lot of the action and it just kind of the f more fun aspects of it than a, a regular drama, I guess. It turned more into an action movie for the better. And I really enjoyed it a lot more because of that. And so I think I'd give it an 8 out of 10. Yeah. I, uh, I really liked Maverick a lot. Um, they definitely did some cleanup on the camera work. And I appreciated all the, the effort and the stunts that were put into it. And it was easier to follow the camera movements and understand, you know, who was in what plane, what direction they were looking, you know, what the whole goal was when they were doing training or if they were in combat. It was easy to follow. And um, I don't know. I, I just like this film a whole lot more. So I give this one also an 8 out of 10. Yeah. Um, this would be an 8 out of 10 for me. Um, if With all of the amazing visuals that this movie gave us, and especially with the more mature storytelling in terms of our character of Maverick. Um, but it falters a bit, and I got a little bit too distracted by um, kind of the weaker romance part of the movie. So um, it kind of dropped down for me, but still a very solid 7. Uh, really enjoyed it. But yeah, I was staying at a 7. Yeah, I think this movie has somewhat of the same effect as Zack Snyder's Justice League. Where, because I looked this up before uh, I watched it, where you watch the you watch the original Justice League and you're like, this was the biggest pile of crap I have ever seen, and I gave that one like a two out of ten. And by comparison, the like when we watched when David and I watched the Zack Snyder cut, we were blown away by like, oh my gosh, there's a story and there's a plot and the the villain, well, that's actually a villain, and like the the dialogue, it kind of works. So like, it, and so you think it's like this like humongous improvement. And when you look back, you kind of realize, all right, not that not as amazing as it was. So like, Justice League went up once two stars for me out of 10. And I'm going to say the same thing for, for Top Gun. We're definitely Top Gun. The original is not as bad as the Justice League. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is like the, by comparison, since I watched these movies like a day apart, the second movie feels a lot better, but I only think it ups the rating a little bit. I gave this one a seven out of 10 too. I would have given it an eight, but with the weird fourth act mission impossible stunt. And the fact that at the end, nobody suffers any consequences. Um, like there's no casualties as a result of this mission. Like I felt like that was a little too that stretched my my sense of uh, my my suspension of disbelief a little too much by the end. So great movie. Would highly recommend people watching it because, like David said, it is exactly what you hope it would be out of this kind of movie and much more what you want it to be than the first movie was. So for me, seven out of ten. Yeah, and uh, a quick little tidbit before we go on, uh, just for listeners out there, I know this movie is also out with uh, the likes of. Uh, the newest Jurassic Park. And I, I just would like to, uh, a closing note for Top Gun Maverick. I feel like this is what we should get, you know, out of, if we're going to get IPs, they're going to come back and we see these actors again and again. Um, I feel like this is just a really great, um, you know, bringing back of something, remake, whatever you want to call it. I feel like in great com contrast, this is a lot better of a job than, even though I haven't seen it, just what they've been doing with stuff like Jurassic Park. So, for all you guys out there, they're afraid of these reoccurring IPs. This is a, a, a good good execution of an old IP. Yeah, this is kind of like the, the Blade Runner 2049 of uh, your dad's favorite movie, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, please write that as your review. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> but um, moving on now, we have a movie recommendation. Last time, Aaron recommended that we watch a uh, very different movie that I had never heard of in my entire life. And I will let him explain it and explain why on earth he suggested <laughs> it to us. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll explain first why. No, I'll, I'll explain the synopsis first. So basically the synopsis of the movie, it's a, it's a movie about Andrew Nichols, the director who really wishes that he understood computers because if he could, he could make the best movies of all time and no one would ever argue with him and he would make loads and loads of money. That is the movie Simone. Just kidding. No, so what this movie really is about, uh, and I saw this 
in a bus in Mexico with Spanish subtitles. So I didn't really know what I was watching and I only caught the last half. And with a lot of movies, you, you kind of give it a benefit of the doubt. If you come in in the middle of a movie, you assume that you know, like, or that the movie set things up appropriately because by the middle of the movie, you're getting into all of the action and all of the conflict. And so I really enjoyed what I saw because it was this really interesting concept of a struggling film director who discovers a computer program that someone made for him that can generate the perfect computer animated female actress. And with the abilities of like chroma keying and green screen technology, he can insert that actress into any movie that he wants. And everybody just magically loves her to death. And she's the biggest actress in Hollywood since Audrey Hepburn. In fact, she's based on Audrey Hepburn, they say at one point. So the movie becomes this like supposed satirical dark comedy of a director who's trying not to let this creation of his run amok with all of his plans and, and, uh, but eventually she just becomes way too popular and the, the stress of trying to make her look like a real person is too much. And he eventually gets into all sorts of shenanigans and trying to, to address this sci-fi high concept. And the, the, the punchline of the movie is it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. One of the ones I want to talk about the, one of the first things I noticed about this movie the sound design was really odd. I don't know if you guys noticed, but for me, I was I watched it with headphones on, so it was it was very glaring a very glaring problem because like the movie starts off and we're we're um, in Hollywood studios, like a bunch of different like warehouses where they're filming and they're in between them with their golf carts and like they're talking and it just sounds like they're in a recording room even though we're like outside, which I I took note of. I'm like, hopefully this doesn't continue. And it doesn't do it all the time, but it was just like another one that I noticed that at one point um, they're scoping out that, that, that football stadium for her to do her concert at Simone, the, uh, the generated actress. Um, they're outside in this echoing football stadium, but again, it sounds like they're like, I don't know, in a recording room with like, sounded walls it was so weird i have never like experienced that in a movie i'm i'm willing to believe that that was partially on purpose because if you notice in those first few scenes in the hollywood sets the lighting is also very hollywood stage-esque where like you have everything is like uh the morning shot is just very normal kind of all washed out but at night it's very green and i thought that was a really interesting choice the whole set looked green and there's another point where like a, in a subsequent shot where everything was very blue and so I thought it was kind of interesting that, like, early on you thought, oh, is this going to be a kind of, like, because Andrew Nichols also did the Truman Show, is this going to be a Truman Show-esque meta-commentary where we are simultaneously commenting on the process of filmmaking while we're also commenting on the process of this process of filmmaking? So I thought, for, I thought maybe we were going to get some, like, over-the-top moments where maybe it was kind of a soundstage or maybe, like, there was only, like – maybe when he's running out on the beach trying to get away from the lawyer that like there'd be a very small amount of space he was running out on or some sort of like other acknowledgement that like we're in a movie and this is that this is the director. Like you can tell he's directing his, his crew off, you know, off, off camera, but they didn't stick with it. They didn't stick with that theme. And, and to be fair, they really didn't stick with any of the themes in the movie. Pretty much anything that gets introduced is just for the purposes of that scene. And maybe the next one, and then we just rinse and repeat. There's no upping of the stakes. There's a whole chunk of the movie, like near 80% of the movie, like uh, the, like 80% of the movie mark where I just kind of lost focus. And I was just, you know, playing on my phone and doing Me whatever. Too. There was a good chunk of the movie where it's like, this is just the same thing over and over again. I don't care. Yeah. Andrew Nichols the entire time was explaining, well, this is how things work. And wouldn't it be awesome if you could just hit a button and she could cry on command? Like, or like uh, Al Pacino's frustrated rant at the very beginning. We don't see anything that, that Al Pacino has made before this. So we don't have any idea what he's capable of doing. And so he's just complaining about not being able to control people. Yeah. And it gave me serious vibes. Uh, I don't know if any of, uh, if, if Spencer TK or, or Jared, if you've ever seen the movie death trap, but I know David has, cause David and I watched death trap together and David, this gave me some major death trap vibes where just like Michael Caine's character at the beginning is a struggling uh, director who really wants to have his breakout piece. And he finally gets his, his breakout piece, but then it's all of the problems that come with it. 
this movie felt like that, except that instead of like immediately understanding who Michael Caine was and what kind of work he's not used to producing and what he's capable of doing, we just see Al Pacino complaining a lot. And then within like two minutes, he has his miracle solution. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the, the first note that I wrote was, wow, this jumps in like so quickly. Like, yeah, you see Al Pacino, he's like on, he's in the lot and his lead actor is quitting right then and there and you see him like trying to like damage control and stuff but you don't know who he is you don't know anything about him you you kind of understand that he's a you barely understand that he's a director and so you don't yeah. really care about him or his trajectory like at one point his his daughter asks um uh like who's who's victor who's victor taransky or he asks that someone does as you know as like a thought-provoking question but like for me it felt like it was a glaring hole that it was kind of opening up, which was like, yeah, who is Victor Taransky? Like, I don't know this mm, guy. I don't know. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, you, he, he stumbles upon, or he's, he's gifted um, after this uh, developer dies, he's gifted his um, final project, which is this like, you know, AI actress. And then it cuts to nine months later. And suddenly he's like an expert at integrating her into movies that he's already shot. And you never get to see like, that should have been the whole first half of the movie should have been mm -hmm. him learning to like use her. And maybe he's like, you know, kind of telling one lie after another. And then like, finally they'd stack on top of themselves so high that everything comes crashing down. But instead he's just an expert at it. Everyone is accepted that she's like this reclusive actress and everyone loves her. And, and, and yeah, for most of the movie, it's just kind of the same scenario happening over and over again, where Oh, she almost gets discovered, but then she doesn't. And then she almost gets discovered and then she doesn't. And it just kind of does that the whole rest of the movie. And then, yeah, the, the end credit scene was like actually good and like funny because, mm -hmm. um, uh, so you, so, uh, Jared, you said that you didn't catch it. Yeah. TK, did you? The end credit scene, like after the post credit? Yeah. Uh, or just like after the yeah. credits. I didn't see it. So what happens is you see Al Pacino in a grocery store and he has a cart, like a shopping cart on a string and he's like pulling it while yeah, recording cam, yeah, yeah, with a hand cam. And then you see him like do that same motion, but then now he's pushing it. And so then uh, he's like doing all this by himself. He's like the only one in the grocery store at night. Yeah. He's walking into the fr frozen food section and like comically bobbing a frozen dish, like up and down in front of the camera to simulate walking with it. And then like, and then it cuts to then Simone doing the same thing. And you can see, okay, that's the finished rendered content that he made. Yeah. yeah. And so it's actually kind of funny because you're watching Al Pacino do this like ludicrous thing by himself just to get this shot of Simone grabbing like a freaking uh, <laughs> chicken pot pie or something. Yeah. That makes sense because like she can't yeah. physically move right. or grab mm -hmm. things. And, and they just put it in the after credits scene instead of integrating it into the movie at all. See, like David and I were talking about it and I think it would have benefited a lot more if they had leaned more into the co uh, comedy aspect of it yeah. instead of making it a drama and trying to have like this deep meta commentary or whatever. But like instead it's like it could have been so much more funnier and have him like trying to hide this thing from the world, Simone from the world. And getting into a bunch of shenanigans and then like learning how to use Simone and just like completely messing that up and having a bunch of weird glitches with her or something. But no, it's like supposed to be like a drama about him, but we don't even know him. Yeah. And all of his relationships that we don't really care about. And they only start caring about him because of Simone. And it's, I don't know, it's really weird i feel like it could have been good ish maybe yeah no i agree because like when i was looking at i didn't even read the synopsis i just saw what it, like what genre is it fell under and it said drama and comedy i'm like oh so it's a dramedy but like if you're to weigh it out on a scale on our spectrum it was more like 70 five percent drama 25 percent comedy if they had bumped it to like a 60 40 then i would i think that would have been a bit better i think it would have balanced it about uh balanced it more and been a bit more entertaining to watch but yeah i, I still liked watching some parts of the film like it, it was still uh i like the story just the concept of it. it was pretty interesting 
there's a line in the movie where they say, oh, Taransky's not that good of an actor because they're talking about like, uh, like, cause they're trying to wiretap his phone and they're only hearing one side of the conversation. And the guy says, oh, there's no way that Taransky could be talking to himself. Taransky's not that good of an actor. And I thought, number one, why would that be the first thing you go to? Like, wouldn't it listen to the more simple explanation that there's nobody on the other end. And the second part is like, we should have had that played up a little bit. Like if at the beginning when he's trying to convince Winona Ryder to stay, he should have read a little bit of his own script to kind of show that, yeah, this guy's like obviously egotistical because he thinks his own scripts are amazing, but he clearly knows how to write for a woman. And then it would explain why he's able to talk in Simone's voice. Cause there's another part where they're like, you know, Simone is all woman. And it's like, okay, so what does that say about Al Pacino? It's like, he's obviously got two sides to his personality. Then he's got the, the masculine side, which is the stuffy, uh, director but he's also got a feminine side and like we don't see the process of him like even establishing Simone's voice or establishing like Simone's personality and so a much better movie would be something where like Simone slowly becomes the externalization of Taransky's ego where at the beginning he thinks he's in total control but as as things go progress he starts to realize that no Simone's in control and then you have a cool little contrast of how could a fictional computer generated personality that I voice be in control of my life instead of me being in control of my life. Like there's all those scenes where he gets out of the car and they all, they all stop clapping as soon as they realize Simone's not there. And you could have had him like he's, he's resenting Simone, even though Simone is just him with a CG body, there could be like this cool con and you could put in some funny, uh, uh, I was thinking like there could be a scene like in Lord of the Rings, two towers where you have like Al Pacino talking to himself but it, and then like slowly it becomes Al Pacino talking to Simone and the two of them are like you just get the, the shot reverse shot so it looks like Al, uh, Al Pacino's talking to Simone and you ha he has a full blown argument with himself that would have been awesome and that would have been kind of funny and witty and kind of dark uh, but instead we don't get that we just that that he has a conversation with himself like twice but you see both sides of it and he's talking both sides of it and then we just move on right we move on to the new yeah. conflict yeah yeah because I feel like they tried to kind of do what you're talking about because when he does have those conversations with Simone, she's often voicing like his inner concerns and stuff, but because you can always hear his voice behind it and you often see him doing the voice himself, you're not, it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like two separate parts of himself. It just seems like he's talking to himself the, the way that like I could just, you know, have a conversation with myself and play both sides. So yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really do it in an effective way that conveys that like inner uh, conflict that you'd want. Yeah, there's even a point where you think they might with they might do that when Simone does not acknowledge Al Pacino uh, at the Oscars. Yeah, but then that's never carried. That's they never carry over with that. They don't. They don't do anything with that. Did I did I miss something? Was she supposed to say uh, thanks to my collaborator Victor Taransky, or did he forget to pro that, program that into they're her? They're never clear. I didn't even notice that. They, they're never clear on that. Okay, because that was just so confusing. I thought at first that she was going to be gaining sentience. But then they never do anything remotely similar to that again. So I was like, okay, I guess, I guess I just misunderstood that scene and the point of it. Yeah, I, I thought yeah. that he was just so lost of uh, being Simone that he forgot, like you know, that you know he's actually playing mm -hmm. her, and that when he said, "I'm also thankful for um, Hank," uh, Hank you know, that was actually him speaking. Like you know, this is the Hank's creation. I'm very thankful for him. You know, but he was just saying that through Simone um, and that he forgot to thank himself because he forgot. Well, I think that's weird, though, and kind of contradictory because the whole rest of the time when he's pretending to be Simone, like uh, the scene where he has Simone talk to the other um, actors in the movie. And she says, just make sure that you always listen to the director. And as long as we do it, Vic Victor Taransky says, then this is going to be a great movie. So, you know, he hasn't had a problem with using Simone to like prop himself up before. So I don't know why when it suddenly it's for an Oscars acceptance speech that he suddenly would forget himself because he's not the kind of guy that would just do that. Well, I, I think it's also in the sense of like in the beginning when he's talk when she's speaking uh, to the new actors and actresses in the film that like he's like, OK, I'm starting from the ground up here. Like I'm going to become famous again, you know, and now he's made it to the Oscars and he got Simone on there twice for two different films. So, so therefore, he's also there with his his ex-wife and his daughter. Like they're there to like cheer him on. Like he's actually like starting to close things off. He's like, OK, I've kind of made it, you know, so therefore I actually have Hank to thank for that. Mm. That he kind of forgot, like, oh, wait, I, it's me. Maybe. I forgot to mention myself in this. I just, I just think it didn't lead to that very well, because, like, Hank, right. the movie kind of forgets about Hank 
almost instantly yeah <laughs> he has a comical like i think the whole his death is like funny like when you think about it like this guy with an eye patch gets like eye cancer because he's been staring at his computer for too long like and then you see that like his tombstone has the picture of him with an eye patch on it like that's funny like <laughs> well yeah that's that's a little bits of comedy that yeah, we were talking that's about. the thing there are like i wrote down all the, the parts that i thought were like legitimately funny um there was one part where um he's driving in the car and he's listening to the radio and the radio is like describing the all like the war and like the sickness that's going on in the world and it says uh, all of that's been overshadowed today by the announcement of the oscar nominations <laughs> <laughs> that was i thought that was great um i love yeah. I love how after um, the interview that Simone has with the talk show where the like detective guys find where she was and like try to blackmail um, Al Pacino's character. I like how then for the Oscar acceptance speech, she's doing this third world tour. And so you see her like in this like place overrun with garbage and feral dogs yeah. and you hear machine guns going in the background while she's like yeah. thanking yeah. everyone for for uh, the award. Um and then I love when they're they're uh, carrying Simone's coffin, and there's like her her lead co-star who's kind of been in like most of the movies that uh, Victor Taransky's directed, and like the cops show up and they they open the, the the casket to find like a cardboard cutout of Simone, and the co-star says that's why it was so light. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, okay, there was one scene that I was laughing at, but it would not fly in today's uh movies so like when he's like uh mad at simone that you know he's she's getting all the recognition and he's not and he's like i'm gonna pretty much just de destroy you right uh and he starts making films that are like just terrible like i am pig was one of them but like when he gets to the interview setup where she's like smoking and she's like looks like a drug addict and she's like, so, so what are some things that inspired you to be a great She was actress? like, I think smoking's great. You know? Yeah. Like all this, all of that kind of stuff. Another thing she's like, I, I think kids should, uh, why, why are there shooting ranges at schools? You got to teach the kids how to defend from themselves. I'm like, that is something that would not fly <laughs> like, by today. Ooh. And then she started talking about immigration. Yeah. I was like, oh my. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> that stuff's pretty touchy nowadays. So. That was a funny moment too, right before that, where they're, uh, he's making the bad movies with her, and it's like she's like eating with pigs, literally, just eating slop, and everyone's just disgusted and hate it. But then they see it, there, it says directed by Simone, and everyone's like, "Oh my goodness!" <laughs> like that made me chuckle a little bit. Um, I did notice, however, um, I was talking about this before the podcast. There was a a line that I I caught on a newspaper. Um, on it was a headline on a newspaper. Somebody was reading, and it said uh, the headline was uh, Terinsky clinging to coattails for three movie deal. As you see his like rise with Simone, and then later he talks to his daughter, and his daughter uh, says to him, "She says you're clinging to Simone's coattails." And I was like, "Whoa, that's kind of weird." <laughs> like, that, first off, that little girl would never talk like that. But I was like, <laughs> in that moment, I'm like, you could definitely tell that that was like one writer for both. Like, for that, that just was funny to me. <laughs> well, that girl, and just in general, yeah, everything, everything. For okay, for me, this this movie, like the they they had an interesting enough of an interesting premise. It'd be like, okay, we have this. Um, what we think is a is a once good director that no one cares about anymore, um, relying on this computer generated actress that's gonna we're gonna see the the consequences of that as him as a director and then having this actress, but then it just feels like okay they're like okay we have this premise then they just throw like a bucket of ideas at a wall and they're just trying to see what sticks. And so it just leads to like a just a bunch of just misses in my opinion. So just like I'm glad I wasn't the only one that checked out at points in this movie because I like was like checking my phone and I'm like oh gosh like am I just out of it today or just I don't know. But I don't know. Just a lot of it just did not keep me wanting to watch, and it was just like here's this idea and then here's this idea and like and but as you guys have said like there's so many different. Uh, avenues they could have taken with this and, and tried to stick with that you could have been more interested as a viewer but they just kind of like did 30 of them and broke them all into different ways like okay this is a funny moment who cares like 
we won't continue that idea. We'll do this idea. That's funny. Or that's, that's serious. And it's like, what? Just like pick something, please. Yeah. That, I feel like this is another movie that almost has no central conflict. Cause you'd think that the conflict would be, he's, you know, he's trying to grapple with like, you know, not trying to reveal Simone, but for most of the movie, like it's pretty easy to do that. Like everyone just kind of believes everything he says. Yeah. So I never really feel like any sort of tension about anything because I don't know, just it's the same scenario over and over again, just kind of tweaked in different ways until finally he just decides the only time where things start to kind of feel more serious is when um, he's being like interrogated for the murder of Simone because he like gets her to the program and dumps all our tapes into the ocean and like he's interviewed in this like post apocalyptic bunker somwhere. <laughs> yeah. Um at least then like okay he's having to like grapple with something but otherwise like yeah it's just it's very repetitive and something that I I told Spencer cuz Spencer and I watched this together to to save on rental costs cuz we didn't want to both spend money on this. Um but I'm glad that I did watch it with someone else because if I were watching it by myself I definitely would have checked out way early and just started like doing something on my phone and at least having someone else there to occasionally quip to and, and ask like questions about why everything was so ridiculous helped me at least like stay focused the whole time. But yeah, uh, going back to, I I don't understand why you had to put the tape or the CDs, everything about her in a trunk. And it's then so that they think that yeah, it was I, a body. <laughs> I know, but you easy could just smash that stuff. <laughs> That's what go, I was saying. Like you can burn all the discs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, either way, it, it just felt like that was just an extra step. No, like five extra steps that weren't even needed. If I was in a, if I was in a Frank, is it Frank? Uh, Victor. Victor. Wow. And it and it and it didn't matter in the end anyway because even though he threw away like a whole trunk worth of discs. The really smart daughter found it on the last drive that he didn't take out of the computer. I oh said that. That, was, that gave that. me that. that gave me like Bell vibes. Yeah, Where, like randomly, this one chick on a computer can easily. Like, oh, here's the coordinates. So, like, <laughs> this is how this works. Yeah. Did you guys notice this super subtle stuff that they would be looking up on the computer earlier in the movie? Like, uh, I, I wrote it down. There was two things. Um, but uh, the movie opens with Agnes. Uh, I'm going to butcher this. Agnes Day which is a, a Latin song that reads the lamb of God who took the sins of the world have mercy upon us, which I thought was an interesting, you know, it's very like, it's very artsy fartsy. Like when, whenever you have like an artsy fartsy movie, they love to use that particular soundtrack. So I thought that was kind of funny again, thinking that it was going to be kind of a meta commentary, but then like th- the only things you see them researching is stuff that literally has to do with the movie. Like the girl, the daughter for no reason is looking up the story of Pygmalion, who was a king and a sculptor who fell in love with one of his own uh, statues. And so like, again, if, if uh, Al Pacino had fallen in love with Simone, there's a plot. Uh, instead, it's the the quirky investigator guy. Who's like the worst investigator on the face of the planet because He's supposed to be figuring out that she's like fake, but then he falls in love with her and just abandons that. And even though he has like rock solid evidence, he doesn't bring it forward. And even though there's several points where he figures out something's wrong, he just explains, explains it away. Like, no, that seems to be stuff that Al Pacino does. Like that would show you that Al Pacino was clever because the investigator says, well, what about this? Why don't, why didn't we find any fingerprints? Oh, well, she's just so meticulous and she's kind of a germaphobe. So she, she wears gloves wherever she goes or, how come the, the, the hotel is in the background of this video that she took? Oh, well, we had it at a different angle, and we just used some camera trickery to still put the mountains behind her. Like, that's all you need in order to do that. But no, instead, the investigator is just incompetent. Uh, Al Pacino's incompetent. Everybody's incompetent uh, dramatically, conveniently, for whenever they need to be in the movie. Except for the daughter. She's, a, she's the most sage person in the world. Yeah, I just find it funny how... I thought that investigator was be like one of the most smartest guys because when they first go to interview um, for about the first movie, what was it? Uh, Sunrise, Sunset, something like that. Uh, they're all excited yeah. to see Simone there, but instead they get uh, Victor instead. And they're all asking like, oh, where's Simone? We waited two hours for Simone. Just Simone this, Simone that. And then he's like ready to leave. Right? He's walking away and that investigator raises his hands 
and I, I'm not gonna lie, he, I thought he was blind. I thought he was like giving off some like daredevil type vibes. You know, there's more to his this character than you. Th- <laughs> um, and he's like, "Who's uh, oh, is it Hank? Oh yeah, yeah, who's Hank?" And like that's what I was like, "Uh oh, this guy might know more than we think he does." I and the, he knew about Hank. Yeah, and then uh, he's like, "He was a good friend or something, something like that." And then he walks away. I thought that we were going to keep building off that, give him that kind of character. But instead, they're like, when they get to the hotel, he's like, I need a moment alone, boys. And he just goes and smells all the stuff that he thinks is Simone's, when in reality, it was just uh, Victor just creating a, a fake set. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. And like, that guy's performance was just so over the top and hammy. It like, I mean, nobody's performance in this movie is great, but like, that guy was just so distracting. I know that place. <laughs> it was also really weird seeing, um, was it Jason Schwartzman, the guy that's in like all of Wes Anderson's movies? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that threw me off. Oh, and also for uh, for me, it was funny right off the bat seeing, we only saw him for like uh, at the beginning and only for a split second later, but the Dean from Community, <laughs> when I saw him, I just like chuckled. Wait, who did he play? Wait, 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 what was he in this? He was uh, part of the committee that was deciding that Trinsky needed to cut the film because Monica, not Mark, Ma- not Mark Lewinsky, um, Winona Ryder. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, this would be a totally different movie. Winona Ryder didn't want to be in the movie. <laughs> Yeah, so he was part of the committee, and he was like, this movie won't cut it. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> it's like, it just looked like a community sketch, like, especially the way the, the vibe of the movie was. <laughs> just so funny. One of the other things I wanted to mention was, like, how cheap this movie looks and feels. I didn't actually look up the real budget, but, like, most of the film seems to take place in, like, two locations. The, like, studio lot with all these, like, blank buildings and then like uh victor trancy's beach house there are a couple of scenes that take place in other locations but i just kind of got this sense of like claustrophobia that we just kept going back to these two places over and over and over again and just having scenes that felt the same happening in the same place yeah and i uh, thought that was the next point i was gonna say like this came out the same year as Obviously, this is a bad comparison because of the budget, but Lord of the Rings, Two Towers, but also the pianist. So, like, just like the it, it looks so dated, right? Yeah, like, it it's I insane. It was the 90s. Uh, this movie came out the same year as uh, Born, Ide- Born Identity, also. What? Signs, Spy Kids 2, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Um, I'm looking at some of the other ones in here Men in Black 2, Minority Report. Uh, Star Wars: Attack of the Clones, and the oh, its opening, its opening weekend, uh, it came in ninth in the box office. Um, it was c- going up against stuff like Signs or Spy Kids too, but like I watched My Big Fat Greek Wedding, and that's a pretty fun movie, and it's a pretty funny movie, uh, and it looks like a pretty cheap not not cheap movie, but probably a an inexpensive movie to make. And Simone had a budget of $10 million compared to like the Truman show that had $60 million for its budget. But Andrew Nichols did had, had no idea where to spend his money because like you guys are saying, it looked like a movie that was a decade uh, older than it was. And uh, it looked like they spent no time. Maybe, maybe most of the money went to getting uh, Al Pacino and uh, Simone. Uh, what was her name? Rachel Roberts. There's no way that like Simone herself cost that much though, because I was looking at her filmography and pretty much the only other things that she's been in are other Andrew Nicole productions. She's some like Canadian actress that I'm just assuming now that uh, Andrew Nicole discovered on his own and just started putting in stuff. So yeah, I have no idea where the, mo- where the, where the budget for this movie went, but it wasn't into the special effects, which you, you know, if you're going to do a, I, maybe it went into that particle effect when he, when Al Pacino dissolved Simone at the end. that they then reversed for when the daughter is able to bring her back yeah because all you have to do is hit a button and it completely reverses a a deletion of a of a file you know you don't need any of the extra hard drives yeah exactly he doesn't matter that like he wiped her from the disc that she was on or the hard drive uh because somehow the computer without the drive in it still has all of that stored somewhere i guess in ram (laughs) He didn't clear his cache after deleting the uh, <laughs> the drive files. 
I, uh, there's also some scenes where, like, you know that it was two different shots that were taken, of course. Like, when uh, Victor is driving in the car, pretending to be oh. Simone. But, like, you can obviously tell, like, his seat's propped up so you can see his head directly. If you were in uh, his ex-wife, is it Elena? I don't know. I forgot. But, like, if you were looking in his car, you can obviously tell he's the one that's actually driving. Uh, that bothered me so much. But I did find it funny when he hit the car. At well, the end the of that conversation. Just, wasn't it weird, though, that he hits the back of the trailer and then there's no consequences? Like, shouldn't someone come out and say, why are you in the passenger seat? And then he has to face off against a massive traffic bill? Like, nope, we didn't have any of that. That would have been too funny, and it would have required the main character to, like, figure his way out of a situation. So we couldn't do that. We needed to have another scene where the, he talks about how Simone is great and <laughs> that he's only popular because of her. Yeah, my notes say right after that, I, I, I mentioned no consequences of hitting the trailer in my notes, and the next line in my notes is just bored. Because <laughs> once that happened, I realized there were, we were never actually going to do anything <laughs> funny with this premise. We weren't actually going to have it be anything where he has to face any consequences for his actions, or there's not going to be any upping of the stakes. And in the end, it doesn't. Like nothing was, Everything goes back to the way it was before. He's not on the hook for killing Simone, even though everyone should question, how come you said she was dead when she clearly wasn't? Uh, there's, you know, there's no ma- major investigation into the fraud that's impl- that that's that it comes with, you know, making a fake fake uh, funeral for her. None of that happens. It's just no, he's fine. Simone becomes a bigger star and she retires from acting. I loved. I would love to see how they explain that she gets into politics. Like, what would she do? She just never shows up to any international meeting. Uh, she just never has to. Tr- you know, what, what? How does that work? Uh, and then. Everyone, you know, and then the the mom, the, the ex-wife, and the daughter are just more than happy to help Al Pacino put on this massive, uh, this massive ruse for the rest of their lives. I guess Dude, that ticked me off. I was like, the whole goal was for him to be like, uh, well, not the goal, but to, what I was seeing was he was using Simone to just get back with his old family, you know, tie things back up to where they were before. And then they're like, you know what? Let's just keep Simone. You know, it's like. It yeah. worked. Let's just keep using it. And I was like, what? No. It's weird that there's absolutely no falling out that happens when they discover his, like, big lie. Yeah. Um, like, you'd expect from, like, the most basic of, and, and you know, basic and cliched, like, story to have, like, oh, this is the part where, like, the big falling out happens, and then he's got to, like, you know, win their trust back. But even that doesn't happen. It just, they're like, oh, Simone was a computer program. Okay, well, we'll just help you out then. Yep. Let's uh, let's make better movies. Let's get a whole cast. Yeah. It's like, what? No. Just dated, sloppy, um, you know, just a mod podge of things thrown at the wall. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Synonym for Simone. <laughs> <laughs> I think um I think overall this isn't this isn't the worst thing in my opinion that we've watched on the for the podcast um and it's also not the weirdest but it's definitely just like the most like bland like it just feels like a boring early 2000s movie that nobody ever watched and that's kind of how i i I feel like i'm definitely gonna forget about this in like one week Mm -hmm. (laughs) i forgot it halfway through this week (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so i think for ratings um we'll go around for me yeah I, I i do see potential in some of the ideas that this movie plays with i think that at times the humor is pretty effective and funny and like there's some just ab- absurd things that happened that got a chuckle out of me but i think overall the execution was just so unbalanced and <laughs> Uh, the the script did not receive the attention or the work that it, it deserved. Um, so for me, this is like a this is like a four out of ten. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat as David. Although I don't think I would be ge- that generous in my rating. Uh, a lot of poten- like it had potential. Uh, I should have leaned into the comedy aspect a lot more. I'm sticking with that, and it just could have been a lot better than it really was. It just felt very sloppy and, I don't know, unfocused again. Mm. And I don't know, I think I would give it a 2 out of 10. It was not that good and I did not enjoy it. (laughs) 
I felt like I had to like watch something else to get the taste out of my mouth. Oh my gosh, this is kind of difficult. I I liked the concept of it. It just wasn't delivered well and didn't sit well with me a lot. Um, again, there were some things I think they could have done a whole lot better with the writing. And I think some characters are just thrown in there just for like a quick second and just taken out. Or they just weren't played well. So I'll give this one like a 2 out of 10 as well. Um, yeah, maybe I would have benefited watching with someone else. Kind of, uh, kind of how Bell was kind of more fun once we all realized it sucked. And we could all kind of like joke about it and laugh while watching it. But it didn't help, you know, just like sitting down here with headphones on watching this. I was like, as, as, as this movie was, I was, un I was unfocused. And yeah, so for me, it's a, it's a two out of 10. Um, some funny moments, but I just, couldn't keep interest. Yeah, I thought this movie, um, like I said, when I saw only the second half, I assumed that the first half had been set up properly to make the the payoff the payoff work uh, and for the the narrative stakes to to make sense and be fulfilling. But really, this was just a series of things that happened and nothing really connected. And by the end of it, I wasn't even sure like what the point was. If I was supposed to be happy or sad for them, or if I was supposed to be giggling. I think, like I said, Andrew Nichols just really thought he was saying a whole lot, a whole lot more than he actually was. Which, judging by some of his other lesser works, I think I think he just didn't quite have the voice that he wanted to. So yeah, for me, it's a four out of ten because it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. I was just looking at some of the two out of ten movies I've rated. And I'm like, yeah, it's not it's not the worst thing I've seen, but it's 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 very forgettable. And I will at least remember those two out of ten movies a lot more likely than I will this. Mm. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Aaron, for the recommendation. And uh, it's great to have you on. We'll, we'll have to have you back another time where, where we get to watch something maybe a little bit better or at least more like fun to talk about. But I, I had a blast talking about this. What are you talking about? It was a lot of fun to just rip this thing apart. Yeah, that's true. It was. That's true. Okay. I was just saying, this is our spectrum of, of movies that we see on here, you know? I guess that's not your fault. Uh, it's another, I mean, I, I, I recommend Tommy, so. You just recommended Simone, the like 2000s version of it. So <laughs> I recommended Bell, like, yeah. and I think we're, that's still the lowest one we've done. So, so that's it for uh, this episode, and uh, we're going to have a movie recommendation for the next episode. And this time, it comes to Spencer. Right. So for this uh, recommendation, it's been on my watch list ever since this movie came out, but I've never gotten around to see it, and I don't think it's a movie any of us have seen either. Uh, but I would like to watch The Revenants with Leonardo DiCaprio in it. Awesome. Okay, well, um, if you want to avoid spoilers for The Revenant before our next episode, go ahead and watch that. Uh, we try to get these episodes out every couple weeks. Um, it's been kind of hard lately with uh, school and everything going on, but thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.